Good morning, guys. All right, I'm not back yet. I'm gonna try to get back every single day. It all depends on the morning. I do something in the morning, and if it doesn't work in my favor, I can't come back. I think you guys can put two and two together and figure out all the other details, because I can't really say more. All right, so here's what we're gonna be doing today. You guys have an hour and a half long today. I would like you guys to watch this video lecture on uh, Christina Rossetti's Goblin Market. I want you to take notes, add them however it is that you wish, whether it's on a sheet of paper, whether it's to your PDF document, whatever it happens to be. And I want you guys to start thinking ahead of how you might potentially use this poem and compare it to Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Um, before I continue this video, there's one thing I really want you to be aware of. I do not have time to edit this video. I'm looking at the clock right now. I'm filming it. It's 827. By the time I film this video, get it uploaded to YouTube, everything, class is going to be starting at 10 o'clock. And I want to make sure you have this. So if there's like an awkward pause or anything, I just didn't have time to edit it out. So I'll do the best I can to just go through this without like screwing it up. But I do apologize if um, I do apologize if I have some of these like kind of stutters or like awkward pauses. But let's get to it. Okay. So Goblin Market is Cristino Rossetti's masterpiece. It is, whether you like it or not, an incredibly important poem for the time. And it was published in 1862. So those of you guys that did the reading over the weekend, you know that throughout the 1800s, there was this huge crusade against marriage, or there was this huge discussion about whether or not marriage should even continue to exist. And one of the most important elements when it comes to discussing marriage has to do with also discussing women's property rights and divorce. Uh, people were basically calling for a complete abandonment for marriage until divorce started to become more readily available. And once divorce started to become more readily available, people are like, you know what, well, now we can get out of marriage, so maybe we shouldn't just completely abandon marriage because maybe it's not as bad or as restricting as it was. One of the things that actually increased marriage availability is called the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1857. And this basically passed about five years before Goblin Market. And I'm also gonna post two essays. I have the essays right here in the window, so I'll show you guys them briefly. But I had to write these essays for one of my classes last September. So what I wanted to do is I'll post them up there. They're short essays. They're only about two or three pages long. And they'll give you a lot of very good information regarding basically what has happened during that piece of time and what that legislation does. And you guys can go ahead and use the, these as a resource for your paper. Technically, it is a scholarly resource. You know, these are actually approved papers of publishing quality. I got good grades on them, so I'm gonna just say, you know, pat myself on the back. I'm a good resource. Anyways, the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1857 basically increased the availability of divorce for regular people. Divorce was regularly available, but usually what ended up happening was only wealthy people could afford it. It had to go through the church, and then also very, very, very few women ended up getting divorced. Um, I, I end up including some of the statistics in my paper, but it's something like three or four hundred cases of divorce were filed and passed, and only three or four of them were women. Um, if a man filed for divorce, they could get divorced pretty much for any reason. They'd just be like, oh my gosh, she's not a good mother. I'm like, okay, divorce passed. But if a woman ended up filing for divorce, it was like impossible. Like the guy had to legitimately kill somebody or like bestiality had to happen. Like something ridiculous had to happen. Um, adultery ended up being an excuse at some point, but even then, a lot of divorces wouldn't pass even if it was adultery. Like, you would have women come into a courtroom and they'd be like, yo, uh, this guy beats the crap out of me. And they'd just be like, um, does he provide money? Yeah, yeah, he does, but he also beats the crap out of me. Uh, does he raise the kids? Uh, no, he doesn't. Oh, uh, I'm just kidding. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Let, let's just leave you in a div let's just leave you in the marriage because like let's say you get divorced how are you gonna make money anyways so what ended up happening a lot during this time is that pretty much any man that wanted a divorce it was fine any woman that didn't that wanted a divorce it was like borderline impossible this was published five years after the basically the increase uh, or the increase availability of divorce. And it wasn't until 1882 that the, uh, the Married Women's Property Act also passed. And the Married Women's Property Act basically allowed women that when they got married, they got to keep their property. 
Let me say that one more time. In 1882, they had to pass an act that allowed women to keep their stuff if they got married. And then if they got divorced, they got to keep the stuff. Okay, so these this is the state of the laws at the time. And I want you to be aware of that because this was written 20 years before the Married Women's Property Act. Uh, women are still basically put in this very submissive position where they are basically held at will to any male dominated patriarchal figures. And you need to be aware of these limitations. So let's officially get started with Goblin Market. So Goblin Market has at least four layers of meaning. The first layer of meaning has to do with the narrative itself. So let's just strip away all meaning and let's just look at it as a story between Laura, Lizzie and the Goblin Men. The goblin men mean nothing, there's no symbolic meaning, it's just all about fruit. That's the first layer of meaning. So whenever you're keeping an eye on, let's say, the figurative meanings and the symbolic meanings, never, ever, ever forget that first and foremost, you have some kind of story and you have to keep track of basically what that story means and how things are happening in that plot. The second uh, layer of meaning, we're looking at assault, the use of women, um, and basically the rape and the molestation of women and this is going to get pretty interesting and a, a little bit brutal here too but um, very important for Rossetti whether it was actually physically happening or not Rossetti would argue that it's figuratively happening no matter what so Rossetti would see women getting physically abused and say that's exactly what I'm talking about and then Rossetti would also see women that aren't being physically abused and she would say, well, you're being figuratively assaulted and you're being figuratively raped by this male patriarchal society. The third thing that's very important to consider, too, is women's currency and wealth. Women do have money in this poem, but the way that money goes about is a little bit strange, and we're going to talk about it. And then finally, there's this fear of the foreign. Rossetti was very afraid of foreign elements and just to be clear Rossetti is not let's say completely clean throughout history she was pretty racist um, she was pretty afraid of basically anyone that wasn't English ruining the English and Christian way of life as she saw it so when you look at any literary figure realize that all of them have a bad side even even the guy I'm studying right now T.S. Eliot I, I love his literature not all of it but I love some of his literature but you know what? He was actually pretty racist too. He hated women because he believed that they were basically a threat to like the classical thing of literature. He also basically didn't want anybody that wasn't English or American contributing to the literary scene because they didn't have this historical awareness. He was also anti-Semitic and believed the Jews were going to ruin everything until after World War II, which then he became basically a zealot for Christianity. All right, uh, let me just go back. Like, Basically what I'm trying to say is uh, nobody in literature is clear conscience. In fact, I'm not even kidding here. Like probably one of the cleanest conscience people in literature is James Joyce. But even then he was a little bit of a drunk and a little bit of a pervert. You know, even Edgar Allan Poe married his 13 year old niece. Okay. AP literature, AP perverts and racists. All right. Let's get into Goblin Market. Four layers of meaning. The narrative, assault and use of women, women's currency, and the foreign. Let's start off with the very first stanza. The very first stanza gives a really, really long, long, long list of fruits. England cannot grow all of this. This is immediately, we're seeing that fourth layer with the fear of the foreign is coming in. You guys are going to see foreign fruit. You're going to see foreign descriptions. You're going to see animalism. All of it is going to be tied to the goblins. Are the goblins positive or negative? They're negative. So uh, we're going to go a little bit more into that. Even the weather itself in summer weather is foreign. We live in California. It's 835 in the morning. The sun is going to come out. It's a cold day, so it's going to be like 65 degrees. You know, in England, this does not happen. So even then, the weather itself is a little bit foreign. And you have this very idyllic pasture uh, scene you have this very like amazing like oh my gosh look at all of this fruit so we have this bounty of food and the beautiful sun is coming out and everything's amazing and then line 34 and 35 we see Laura and Lizza, Lizzie coming in not Lizzo Laura and Lizzie if you want to picture Lizzie as Liz Lizzo go for it uh, just make sure you do golden hair okay so they come in 
And we start to see basically uh, Lizzie, she's basically keeping away, and Laura is the one that does look at the goblin men. Line 60 is pretty important here because what's happening is Laura is looking at the fruit and she says, how fair the vine must grow, whose grapes are so luscious, how warm the wind must blow through those fruit bushes. And she's immediately idealizing this foreign entity. She's like, look, it's foreign, it's beautiful, look at that fruit, therefore where they come from must be perfect. And this kind of goes into basically how many people viewed the marriages. It's like, oh my God, look at that woman. She lives in that beautiful manner. How amazing that fruit must be. How amazing that home must be. And Rossetti is introducing this idea where there's this disconnect between the perception and the reality. You perceive something and ends up being looking, looking really, really good, but then the reality of the situation must be much, could be much, much worse. And you're looking at Laura and Lizzie, who are both maidens. They're these virginal maidens. They're not married. So at a certain point in time, they're looking at someone that might be married and be like, oh my gosh, how amazing that fruit must be. How amazing that marriage must be. And so that's, that's that extension of marriage basically connected to the fruit. And Lizzie immediately warns, like, oh, look, you got to be aware. You got to be um, aware. Their gifts would harm us. And, and as we know, like through the whole entire poem, that's exactly what does happen. The goblin men are basically described in much more detail around line 72, and they're very animalistic. The one thing I would want to point out, because there are numerous descriptions of the goblin men, this first description of animalism ends up being roughly neutral, maybe positive. I would interpret it as positive. A lot of the descriptions seem to be something associated with cuteness or something that's aesthetically pretty. Like let's say they have the voice of doves, they're cooing all together. There is this idea of togetherness and unity which you're gonna see. And there is also this idea of foreignness, that, they, that these goblin men are not from this land and neither is the fruit that they bring. Everything is foreign, but how great must that foreign entity be? Laura is also connected a little bit to a swan. She's animalized and idealized a little bit. We're going to go into that further with a better line. And then the other thing connected to the goblin men, and I did color code a little bit in my annotations, which you guys will have. Around line 95, brother with queer brother, signaling each other, brother with sly brother. So you have this idea, it's almost like a gang war. You have these two camps between the goblin men and the girls that are sticking together. Probably the first reference to currency comes in around like line 107. Uh, Laura tries to buy some of the fruit, but she has no money. And then in turn, they offer her like, hey, we'll give you this fruit if you give us a little bit of your hair. And this is one of the first references of basically women's currency. What do women have to offer? And one of the things that many families would do is they would attach something called a dowry. And basically a dowry would be something where like the male figures in the family would raise a large sum of money, attach it to a daughter. So when the daughter got married, they would be able to get that money and encourage a good person to marry her. Uh, it's basically was like bribing good possible husbands to marry their daughters. Be like, oh my God, that guy has a really good job. He has a really good mansion. If you marry my daughter, you'll get an extra 5,000 pounds or you'll get 10,000 pounds or 500 pounds. Look, we're a good family. We can support you. So that was the general mentality. And you can think of it what you will. Um, I think it's kind of a glorified way of selling somebody. But nonetheless... Um, that's what did happen at that time. But Rossetti seems to be basically saying that that's not important to the goblin men. The goblin men don't care. You have much gold upon your head. That's line 124. Buy from us with a golden curls. So there's obvious that wealthy and positive connotation of gold and golden that's being attached to her hair. And they clipped the precious golden lock. She dropped a tear more rare than pearl. And Rossetti, through this language, is basically talking about the wealth of the woman's body and how the goblin men are stealing the wealth of the woman's body. And in turn, you have these very, let's just say vivid lines. Uh, line 135, she sucked and sucked and sucked the more fruits which the unknown orchard bore. She sucked until her lips were sore, then flung the emptied rinds away, 
but gathered up one kernel stone, so one seed, and knew not was it night or day, as she turned home alone. There's a lot in that line. So this is probably one of the first instances where you can say basically sexual assault or sexual activity. It depends on how you interpret the intent or how you interpret consent. So if you want to, you can interpret the consent in this scene and say that this is basically sexual activity. Um, if you want to say that she is not consenting, then it would be rape or sexual assault. I'm going to leave that up to you to decide. But I do want to make sure that it's very, very clear there is a lot of sexual language here and it's very intentional. You have something that sounds very sing-songy, very fantasy orientated. It sounds like a, king, uh, a kid's poem. It's almost like Alice in Wonderland. And then all of a sudden, the stanza out of nowhere just comes out and smacks you in the face. And I'm pretty sure a lot of you, when you're reading it, are just like, what? What just happened? And that's very intentional. When you look at the genre that she's using, she's using a fantasy genre to basically discuss something that is very, very not fantasy orientated. And this is where I actually really, really respect, really, really respect Christina Rossetti. Christina Rossetti, regardless if you agree with her or not, which I do not agree, was attempting to tackle this idea of women's bodies being used by society, by men, for their own advantage. It's not like people were getting married, or it's not like people were having sexual activity for the finances alone. Rossetti was very explicit saying that basically men in society were trying to steal the wealth of a woman. And the wealth of the woman was attached to her body with the gold upon her head. There are some issues with this idea, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. And when I come back, I want to make sure to give you guys a platform to where we can do that um, and talk about it and allow your guys' thoughts to be there. But I want to make sure that we first understand that that passage is very intentionally sexual. Um, and one of the things that happens is after that sexual activity, she turns home alone. There's this isolation. She's not around the sister anymore. There is no, br she's not welcomed into the brotherhood of men. There is this teasing, there is this welcoming, there is this use, and then she is discarded. She is tossed aside. When she eventually ends up getting home, Lizzie ends up giving her a lecture as if she's a big sister about Jeannie. And Jeannie is in here as a cautionary tale. She's like, look at Jeannie, she was used. And then she dwindled and grew gray. And then she ended up dying. <laughs> and she's like, basically, if you have sexual activity, you're gonna grow old all alone and then you're gonna die. Um, or if you listen to the goblin men and allow the goblin men to use you, you're gonna grow old and die. And this is where it's very important to keep a, a lookout between the narrative and the symbolic meaning. What happens in the story? Genie eats the fruit and then eventually grows old and dies. What does it mean? Well, that depends on kind of which part of history we latch onto, how we interpret the whole thing. So make sure you separate those two and then try to make that jump. Because the meaning can change depending on which details you focus on. And Laura just brushes her off. She's like, you know what? Don't even worry about it. You, these fruits are amazing. I'll bring them home to you. You'll know. Um, and then Lizzie doesn't really care. And then they go back to work. They, they go to sleep, uh, golden head by golden head. By the way, they're intentionally interchangeable. They're supposed to basically be the same person. So if you picture them as twins, if you just want to picture them as two Lizzo's with golden hair, it works fine. And they lie down next to each other together. There is again this idea of unity. Um, there's no sexual, uh, you know, they lie down in one bed, but there, there's no like sexual activity or there. It's uh, just plutonic in this case. So I just want to make sure that's clear. You have them connected to ivory where their skin is very pale and wealthy, cheek to cheek and breast to breast locked together in one nest. Uh, so we have this like very strong idea of unity, even though they have this fight. And afterwards they get up, they start to work and Lizzie with an open heart, Laura in an absent dream, one content, one sick in part, one warbling for the mere bright day, day's delight, one longing for the night. There is a complete separation between the two of them in terms of how they go about their day and how they basically return to their lives. Lizzie is fine. She goes about with open heart and they go on and they continue working, 
But Laura is absent. She's listening for the goblin's cry. She's had a taste of the apple from the Garden of Eden. And she wants more. She's had a taste of that forbidden fruit. And, and I'm making that religious comparison intentionally because there's a lot of religion in this poem too. Christina Rossetti was very religious. Okay. <clears throat> and we end up seeing the goblins again. They're racing, whisking, tumbling, hobbling. Um, let alone the herd. So they are like kind of herding around left and right. They're watching. They're looking for people. But they're no longer calling for Laura. They're calling for Lizzie. And Lizzie ends up bringing up probably the central question of this poem. It's uh, line 253. Then if we lost our way, what should we do? And Rossetti is very intentionally asking this question, like what do we do with a lost and fallen women? And she would basically call these lost and fallen women, women that have basically resorted to prostitution, or women that have had sexual activity and then couldn't get married, or women that have, are basically not Christian anymore. Uh, one quick positive shout out to Christina Rossetti. She actually saved a lot of people from really, really, really bad situations. She was in a pretty good financial position and she went out and she volunteered to help reform prostitutes and basically provide them a life outside of prostitution for their own um, living. So she actually did help a lot of fallen women in her own way. So, um, you know, we are going to criticize Rossetti a little bit through this, but I also do want to celebrate the fact that she actually did a lot of very positive actions to help out other people. She wasn't just all talk. And she is expressing her own view and the way that she functions and her own kind of morality. And she did act on this too. So when it comes to calling her a hypocrite, we have to, we're actually pretty limited on that. Like she, she actually did do what she said she was going to do. Laura ends up cold, uh, turning as cold as stone. She's deaf and blind to the goblin man. There's a passionate yearning, this idea of like addiction. And then she starts to grow thin and gray and decay. At one point in time, she even takes this little seed that she got from the goblin men and she tries to grow it with her own tears. She starts crying and crying in this ridiculous melodramatic scene. I love the scene and, and it doesn't work. And there's this analogy as if she's like this lost sailor desperately searching for water and um, that analogy is very important because a sailor is completely surrounded by water but can't drink any and the same exact thing she's completely surrounded by the goblin men but none of them will call to her and she's desperately longing for the goblin men's attention she stops eating she stops working and then at a certain point in time Lizzie is just like oh my god she's gonna die and Jeannie comes in and she's like, oh my God, she's going to die. She should have been a bride. Jeannie should have been a bride. Laura should have been a bride. But instead it's like, oh crap. Like if I don't do anything, Laura's going to die just as well as Jeannie. Oops. There we go. Laura dwindling seemed knocking at death's door. Well, Lizzie weighed no more, better and worse. And she took a silver penny in her purse. So again, money. The question is, do the goblin men care about money? What is the currency of women? So she comes up to the goblin men and they're much, much more hostile now. They are still very animalistic, but they're much more uh, hostile. Helter skelter, hurry scurry, chattering like magpies, fluttering like pigeons, gliding like fishes. There's much more movement. And they hugged her and kissed her, squeezed and caressed her. So then this brings into another interaction. They take the fruit and they start shoving it in her face. She tossed a penny and they reject it. So she offered the money. She offered the dowry for her sister, for Laura, but they rejected it. And the goblins just went absolutely nuts, grunting and snarling. One called her proud, cross-grained, uncivil. Their tones waxed loud. Their looks were evil. And they legitimately started to physically abuse her, barking, meow, uh, meowing, hissing, mocking, tore her gown and soiled her stocking, twitched her hair up by the roots, stamped upon her tender feet, held her hands and squeezed their fruits against her mouth to make her eat. So, going back to this idea, does she have consent in this case? The answer is no. So, the previous instance, you could actually in some ways 
argue whether there's consent or not. You can say she did consent because she was the one that wanted the fruit and she took the fruit and she was happy about the fruit. You could also argue that there was no consent because she was manipulated and she was unaware. It's kind of like a statutory rape argument where she was unaware of what she was doing. Therefore, there was rape. She was inebriated. inebriated. However, this incident is very, very clear cut. There is just flat out no consent. So you could actually interpret this as basically her being raped by the goblin men, which then makes it a very difficult, knowing that that's the content, that's a very difficult content to navigate. But I want to look at some of the language associated with Lizzie here. White and golden Lizzie stood, like a lily in a flood, like a rock of blue veined stone, lashed by tides, obstreperously, like a beacon left alone in a hoary, roaring sea, like a ver like a ver royal virgin town, topped with gilded dome and spire, closed, delagered by a fleet, mad to tug her stranded down. You have this idea where she's resisting, and through her resistance, despite the fact that everything happens to her, despite the fact that the assault does occur, through her resistance, she is still pure and virginal. And this idea of her being virginal, we'll talk about the word virgin, especially when we talk about Mina Loy. It's a very, very important thing, because when we're looking at Christianity, one the beacon of light in Christianity, the female... The pinnacle of basically female behavior is held up as the Virgin Mary. Women are held up a bit on a pedestal by being virginal and pure. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later, but let's continue on. So through her resistance, she's basically virginal. One may lead a horse to water, twenty cannot make him drink. Though the goblins cuffed and caught her, coaxed and fought her, bullied and besought her, scratched and uh, pinched her, black as ink, kicked and knocked her, mauled and mocked her, Lizzie uttered not a word, would not open lip from lip. They could not make her eat the fruit. So looking at this action, you can basically say that Rosetti is basically saying you can't force anyone to do anything. And she's kind of putting a little bit of a blame on the Loras. She's kind of basically saying like, hey, look, if, if you're going out there and you are used by the goblin men, that's because you are not as virtuous as Lizzie. You are allowing yourself to be manipulated. So the way that Rossetti would look at that first instance where Laura eats the goblin fruit, Rossetti would basically say that Laura made a choice. And by making that choice of eating the goblin fruit, there was consent and there was also sin in that action. And for Rossetti, there is an immediate sin attached to any sexual activity. Okay. So she did not eat the fruit. And then eventually the goblins just ran away. She was deteriorated. She still maintained her money because again, we've kind of already talked about it. The goblin men don't care about the money whatsoever. And then Laura comes in and you have a lot of these very strange lines, but I want to mention that it's not intentionally sexual with this interaction. The language there is a little bit there, but it's plutonic. So it's not about the sexual activity between Laura and Lizzie. It's about the sacrifice between them. Do you miss me? Come and kiss me. Never mind my bruises. Hug me, kiss me, suck my juices. Squeeze from the goblin fruits for you. Goblin pulp and goblin dew. Eat me, drink me, love me, Laura, make much of me. For your sake, I have braved the glen and had to do with the goblin merchant men. And this is a perfect example of a Eucharistic sacrifice. So let me drink some tea really quickly. So for any Catholics out there, you should be familiar with the Eucharist. So the Eucharist is uh, the idea is that you, you take a piece of bread and eat it at the end of Mass. Um, but it's not a piece of bread. It's blessed by a priest and turned into the body of Christ. So the idea is that God sacrificed himself or uh, Jesus sacrificed himself for man's sin. And as a result, you are honoring uh, honoring Christ by taking the Eucharist and by taking the Eucharist you are cleansing yourself and you yourself are becoming pure through the sacrifice of Christ so in a nutshell it means someone sacrificing themselves and I wrote it in these notes which you guys can see Jesus sacrificed himself for the sins of man Lizzie is sacrificing herself for Laura's sin 
This is Rossetti's version of Jesus' sacrifice. That's about it. But like, like it, it's a pretty one-on-one -on -one representation, and it's very intentional. So the Eucharist is consumed in mass. It's eaten as the body of Christ, and Lizzie is being figuratively eaten for the sins of Laura. That's why there's really no sexuality here. There's no sexuality in this particular line. It's because of that Eucharistic sacrifice, that she sacrificed herself for her sister. Right. Where is it? For your sake, I have braved the glen. And then as a result, she basically comes back from life. She's able, she's a caged thing free, line uh, like 507 or 506. And she's ri revitalized. And this is something where like at this point you should be able to answer this. It's like, you know, why did this work? Why did this Eucharistic sacrifice work? I mean, it's pretty obvious. It's sacrifice, right? Um, it, it's because someone sacrificed for someone else. The, the first act of the eating of the goblin men was selfish, and this act is not selfish because Lizzie is doing that for Laura. And then finally, we get to the point where there's no longer aging, there's not one thread of gray, and then years later, they're married now, but not to goblin men. This is where there's like a little bit of a flaw. What's the difference between men and goblin men? Um, and Rossetti seems to be leaving that out. Um, you know, the way I would interpret it is that like regular men are fine and Rossetti would probably say they're like Christian men that follow the philosophy of Christ. And um, then the goblin men would be unchristian men or men that don't act in a Christian manner or men that are not Christian at all. And she talks, she gives a cautionary tale about the haunted glen. And then they end with this... Um, Basically, they join hands together and they end with this chant. For there is no friend like a sister in calm or stormy weather to cheer one on the tedious way, to fetch one if one goes astray, to lift one if one totters down, to strengthen whilst one stands. And it's a call to unity and it's basically a call for sisterhood. And one of the most important things that you really have to get out of this poem is this idea of sisterhood. It is hugely important. In the 1800s, there was a huge call in numerous works, both long and short, where they were basically calling for the unification of women, that women had to look out for each other, that it was the job for the women to look out for each other because the men were all grouped up together in these goblin hordes that would run around and violate women's rights. So the women had to look out for each other and stand together. Um, it, it's a good example of like if you take an arrow and you break it, it's pretty easy to break one arrow, but if you take a bunch of arrows and you try to break it, you can't. And there was a huge call for sisterhood and unity among all women so that they would support each other. So that was a lot. I'm running on 32 minutes now. And if you made it this far, I am proud of you, genuinely. I'm really sorry for this long lecture. There's a lot of stuff here. So let's see if we can just wrap this up. What are you supposed to get out of this? So, in the end, Rossetti's basically saying, like, look, we need to create a sisterhood between women, that men will violate women, that men will use women. Um, women are being violated both, both phys uh, physically and figuratively, and at the same exact time, uh, they're being manipulated economically speaking. Okay, simple enough. Let's go into the problems. I want to talk about two problems. First and foremost, the first problem has to do with the fear of the foreign. Rossetti was desperately afraid of anything that wasn't English and Christian. It was also her view of Christianity, too. I can't remember exactly which version of Christianity she was, but when she's talking about the goblin men, she's attaching it to basically anybody that is not her version of Christian and anybody who's not English. This is one of the big problems of it. Um, you can call it xenophobic, uh, and it would actually be very, very accurate. Christina Rossetti was also very racist. She um, wanted to call for a more pure and more white England. It's fine. Nobody's pure in literature. But I want to make sure that's 100% clear throughout this poem. I don't have too much of a problem with it because the poem doesn't try to tackle race in a sophisticated manner. So I'm willing to kind of take that, put it aside and be like, okay, let's just like kind of put aside the racial part. That's not too important. She's not too demeaning to different groups of people. But I do want to make it clear that when it comes to the goblin men, we're, we're not just looking at bad men because 
the way Christina Rossetti would define bad men would also be anyone that's foreign. So we're talking about anyone from Spain, France, Germany, um, a any black people coming into the country, like anybody at all that would be foreign, and then also not her version of Christian. The second thing I have much more of a problem with, and this has to do, and you probably heard it when you did the, the lecture over the weekend, um, and I don't really have a direct answer for this. I do have an answer which we'll talk about more in class that I think you guys will like, that will allow everybody to kind of feel relatively comfortable with it. But there's a bit of a problem by with the, the image of the woman as being virginal and pure. Now, if you are Christian and you abide by this, I'm not trying to insult your beliefs at all, and it's perfectly fine. I'm not trying to basically, uh, but I would like to kind of like present this idea so that you understand possible challenges to that beliefs, and then you can address it and you can learn how to live with this particular challenge. But if women are held up to this incredibly high standard of being virginal and pure, that means that if a woman makes any possible mistake or if a woman is violated, then her worth is ruined. So she holds up this idea and Rossetti holds up this idea that when a woman is violated the same way that Laura is violated, that it is her choice. And that when Lizzie basically refuses the goblin fruits, she's making a choice and everyone's going to know that she's pure and that there will be this glow around her. There are plenty of cases of women that enter marriage and try to do the right thing and then are violated and abused after the marriage is done and the system is not set up to allow them to succeed. And there's a difference between reality and perception. And there's an immediate perception that divorce, you know, is really, really bad. And that if it happens, clearly both sides are ruined. So when it comes to this idea of purity and virginity, women in the 1800s always ended up on the wrong side of the coin. Any sort of sexual activity was immediately de deemed sinful and society was not sophisticated enough to distinguish between women that made the, the wrong choices and women that were victims. And we're seeing the same exact thing today when we basically talk about sexual assault. If you go back, let's say four or five years to the Me Too movement, or you go back even now, if a woman makes a claim of sexual assault, there is immediately this huge dialogue and this huge fight between two parties. One party that says we always believe the person that is accusing sexual assault. And then another party that will say, oh, well, she might have been asking for it or she allowed that to happen to her. And I don't want to present an answer to this because I don't know. But I do want to present that problem, that when sexuality and purity and virginity is immediately tied to womanhood, as it has been for hundreds and hundreds of years, it's simultaneously a Christian belief and a Christian idea. And it can also be a problem because any sort of sexual activity ruins the woman. Um, and then what ends up happening is women are basically treated as products. It's almost like they're treated as cars. Why have the used car when you can get the brand new car? Why would a brand new car marry a used car? Oh, that woman is, has a child. She's automatically ruined and valued less than a woman that doesn't have a child and doesn't have sexual activity. This legitimately happens right now, even with like dating sites. I have a couple friends that are in their 30s that are trying to date and they complain because they'll be like trying to date somebody and they find out like, oh, they liked this girl, but she has a child, which I'm always conflicted about because on one end, I understand their perspective because it's like the, the guy doesn't want to marry in to be someone else's, you know, to be a father. But on the other end, I'm also conflicted because I'm like, why are you valuing that person less because they have had past sexual activity? Why are you valuing that person less because they have created a child? So again, I don't know. Um, it's a complicated issue and we're going to read the other side of it when we go with Mina Loy and we go to Joyce's Penelope and we're going to look a little bit on the other side of like, you know, what happens if a woman basically glorifies or or participates in sexual activity and then allows that to like be part of her life, you know, what are the ramifications and repercussions of this? But I want to introduce to you guys in a very sophisticated manner, in a non-simplistic manner, 
You know, there's no easy answer here. There's no rainbow where it's like sexual activity is bad. Unless you want that to be your answer, and then that's fine. You know, um, I'm here to teach you literature. I'm here to teach you the complexities of the answers and to point out those sophisticated contradictions. My job is not to teach you what you believe. Okay? So, I'm done. It's 40 minutes now. It's a long lecture. I'm really sorry for the length of the lecture. There was a lot here. Um, if you've watched this whole entire thing during the course of the hour and a half, you still have some time. What I'd like you to do from this point on is just start maybe working on your, um, let's go to Google Classroom. Let's see, this is, will take uh, 30 seconds. I'm almost done with the video, I swear. So let's go to Google Classroom. If you go to Classwork, I'm gonna post the Mina Loy thing today. Um, what you really need to start working on is, let's see, where is it? We got important, women's literature perspective. There's a major project, the research report. You need to start working on this research report. The research report, it, it all explains it here, and um, I tried to write it quickly, simply. I'm not being overly complicated and political with this, so please read it. it please, like seriously read it. You're going to start off with um, basically a guiding question, and you have to create a unique document, and you have to do these four things. And these four things involve creating a, do a guiding question. You're going to pick four quotes from each text you plan to do. So if you plan to do Goblin Market, you, you have to do Pride and Prejudice. You're going to take those four quotes. Um, you're going to do two nonfiction resources. So I want you to actually like use them. Um, and then you're also going to create a draft thesis. This is what we're going to be doing all of next week. I will hopefully be back, fingers crossed, tomorrow. Tomorrow is Wednesday. Today is the 25th, so hopefully I'll be back on the 26th. Again, it just depends on the morning. I'm trying every single morning to get back to you guys. I really want to get back to help you guys out and work with you. But you guys need to start working on this. And what I'd like you to do is I want you to start thinking about what question you're going to cover. I have a bunch of sample questions here. I even have a basic template. You're going to want to start pulling quotes from this, at least from Pride and Prejudice. You're going to start thinking about nonfiction resources, and I have a bunch of them right here. Uh, and then afterwards, you're going to create a thesis statement. And this is your goal before next Friday. And once you finish that, you have a basic uh, outline for your paper. And you'll be able to get started and things are going to go smoothly. So I hope this was useful for you guys. Uh, please leave a comment if you watch this. I would love to see like some kind of comment in there. Um, you know, like, yo, Mr. Tridiak, thank you very much for spending 45 minutes this morning to create this lecture. Yo, Mr. Tridiak, I really hated Goblin Market, or I really liked it. Or, hey, Mr. Tridiak, thank you for making things complicated and not overly simple. I'm not trying to tell you guys what to think. I'm trying to show you guys all the ways you can think about this text. And then you guys can maybe find your own nook and cranny and whatever works with your journey and whatever works with you. Um, so I love you guys. I miss you guys. Hopefully I'll see you soon. Um, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys.